Because when you think about it, endings in the therapy room can be quite positive. It means that the client has reached a point where they feel okay to go out and spread their wings on their own without your support. So in, in one respect, it's quite a positive thing. Oh, if you can get an end, yes, absolutely. I mean, Eric Byrne, the originator of transaction analysis, he wrote the first book on transaction analysis in 1961. And if you talk to him, I'm sure, about endings, he would say it's the, um, it happens when the person has resolved their contract. In other words, yeah. they've achieved what they came in for, and then they either recontract or they end. And yeah. hopefully they end from an adult place with celebration. Yeah. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is the Therapy Show Behind Closed Doors podcast with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome to the next episode of the Therapy Show Behind Closed Doors with myself and the wonderful Bob Cook. And we're on episode 59. And what we're going to be looking at tonight is endings in the therapy process, which pretty much covers lots of things, really. Many, many things. I'm in a good mood today. Manchester City are doing very well in the football. Oh, football. Good mood. Uh, so I'll be more than happy to talk about endings. Don't talk about football. <laughs> I don't like football. I prefer rugby. <laughs> Especially Manchester City. Yeah, just any football. Yeah. So endings in the therapy process. We could be talking about the client's ending or yeah. the therapist ending or endings discussed within the therapy process. Lots of things. Yeah. Now, I um, have been running courses, seeing clients for getting on for 39 years, maybe 40 when I started. 84, 20, 38 years. And for those 38 years, I've been saying hello and goodbye to many, many clients yeah. on courses as well, but clients particularly. Um, I've lived in the world of endings and goodbyes. How this are you personally with endings? Does that have a bearing on it in the therapy room? Oh, yeah. You see, I think our own... Um, processes, what's happening internally for the therapist is always having an impact in the therapy room and endings is simply part of the internal process for everybody. If you took, I think, eight, of, eight out of ten people in the street and it talked about how are you with endings, they're all going to have uh, their own process around endings. Yeah. Some of them might say, oh, I'm not very good with endings. When I go to parties, for example, I don't really like to say goodbye. I just go out of the back door and I like to just go out and leave the party if I feel ready to go. Other one might say, oh, I have to make sure I shake hands with everybody before I go. So we all have different processes around endings and it's no different in a psychotherapy room. And it's the same for the therapist and for the client. Therapists per se will have history about endings and beginnings. And I think that impacts the whole process actually. Yeah. Um, so I think it's very important for the therapist to know about how they are with regards to endings themselves, because that will impact the process. Yeah, totally agree with that. I'm not sure I'm very good with endings. No, I think people have their different processes. I mean, I certainly have. I mean, I think, think of my own history. There's a whole history about saying hello, saying goodbye in the therapy room, but also... If you go back younger in my life, uh, I have lot, had a lots of losses, for example. Um, and when we talk about endings, we're always talking about loss and we're yeah. always talking about change. Uh, and that often is, you know, the counter transferential position that therapists might find themselves in. So, for example, instead of going to deal with the endings per se, that may include feelings, they may end from an intellectual place rather than a feeling place. Yeah. For example. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So endings is a big subject. Um, of course, our clients do end of relationships with us and move on. Uh, but that usually mirrors all the difficulties or 
or not their own internal history. Yeah, because when you think about it, endings in the therapy room can be quite positive. It means that the client has reached a point where they feel okay to go out and spread their wings on their own without your support. So in, in one respect, it's quite a positive thing. Oh, if you can get an end, yes, absolutely. I mean, Eric Byrne, the originator of transaction analysis, he wrote the first book on transaction analysis in 1961. And if you talk to him, I'm sure, about endings, he would say it's the, um, it happens when the person has resolved their contract. In other words, yeah. they've achieved what they came in for, and then they either recontract or they end. And yeah. hopefully they end from an adult place with celebration. Yeah. Have you ever ended a contract with a client because you feel like they've reached Oh, well, now you're talking about a really big subject which comes up a lot in psychotherapy. And that is, uh, it's a really big subject. You know, um, the, when the client may or may not get dependent on you. Yeah. So the therapist can see the changes, for example, and um, they can see a resolution of the contract. Yeah. Um, and the client still wants to stay in therapy. Now, that may be because they need to have, you know, other contracts to other things, but also um, they often need the therapist sometimes to say, you know, it's interesting, we've achieved this, this, and this, and perhaps it's maybe time for us to move on. So the therapist themselves initiates the ending. Yeah. Now, you can, I was thinking of my own daughter, you know, <laughs> or, or, or in general, when teenagers or children leave leave home, teenagers, I mean, young adults leave home, that they, they may stay for a very long time. And sometimes they need the psychological permission of the parent to leave. Yeah. I think I've been in that sort of situation where I've felt parental and had to nudge clients sometimes. Yeah. Uh, 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 nudge them with permission. Yes, definitely. Yeah. And let them know that I'm not going anywhere. Yeah, it's okay for you to experiment outside and it's okay for you to come back if you need to. But yeah. You can take my words with you and, uh, you know, give them permission, the psychological permission to leave home. Yeah. Which is quite a nice way of putting it, psychological permission to leave home. Yeah. Yeah. And you and really important what you said with the knowledge that you're, that you aren't going anywhere and you can come back if you need to. Yeah. Yeah. For me, that's just the safety net that, you know, it, it's not like I'm disappearing or ending completely or anything like that. But how do we know whether, you know, real cure has taken place unless the client is okay with going out and living their life? Yeah, and experiment that. So say the contract was to have a more robust sense of self, for example. Yeah. And um, we have the parameters for that uh, within the contract. Then it's important maybe we make another contract or, uh, or, or the therapy is terminated. I mean, by both, pine, both, both sides from an adult position. And if they're still in the child eager state, they may need work to do around endings or they may need psychological permission to leave. Yeah. See, I think that's one of the things that I found quite easy when I was working from the Manchester Institute, you know, as a, when I'd just done my competencies and I was still doing my training because we saw low cost clients for a set period of weeks. So we, we both went into it knowing that you know there was a time scale to it so we knew when the ending was coming so it kind of took some of the weight and that off both me and the client to a certain extent yes that's true and of course uh, in the nhs um, yeah it may be time limited cbt particularly is cognitive analytical therapy is emdr is so there's a beginning middle and end yeah Whereas with, with, you know, psychotherapy that, that we do, we don't generally contract for a fixed length of time. There is no fixed term to it, unless it's contracted at the beginning. 
No, no, that's that's to his private psychotherapy. And again, Eric Byrne talks about this and says, well, you know, a contract is a bilateral contact, um, working towards a specific outcome. Yeah. The outcome is reached by both parties, then therapy may end. Mm. So for him, transactionalism has contractual theory at its center. Yeah. And it was the completion of the contract which would be a signal for the work ending. Yeah. And I suppose that's when both parties agree that that contract has been completed. That's right. That's true. And I think it's a very good point to talk about where, where it's time limited. It takes that, you said, pressure, that responsibility or that structure. You know, it's, it's set up in yeah. the middle of an end, which um, is different from the therapy which in the private sector and many of the therapeutic processes could go on for quite a long time. Yeah. And of course, you know, the endings may evoke some child responses where there was so, you know, so much significant loss or so much significant trauma that healthy endings never happen. Yeah. So that actually could, you know, that could actually bring another piece of work particularly around loss and endings in itself. Yeah, and I, I can 100% see that happening, that once an ending is spoke about, it might evoke some sort of a reaction or a response from, from the client around that. That's right. I mean, I, I think you brought up, brought up a very good point earlier on, which we, I'd like to go back to a moment. And that's the, well, two parts to it you brought up. Once the therapist counter transference about endings, let's deal with that. Let's take a scenario where a psychotherapist has had problems in their own histories about loss and endings. So they unconsciously, um, and I mean unconsciously, play a part in the client staying far too long in therapy. Because the feelings of the rupture and the attachment with the client uh, may be hard for the therapist to cope with. Yeah. So they, I don't think with with intent, but unconsciously, um, you know, may encourage again unconsciously for the client to stay because they don't want to feel the ruptures of the endings themselves. It's not the ending with the clients; the ending way back in history, the yeah. therapist is defending against or might be defending against. Yeah. Because we're not immune to all this stuff. We're human just like everybody else. And like you say, if we've got, you know, things in our past that we haven't processed or dealt with, then that is going to be in the therapy room with us as well. Yeah. I mean, we're talking about, when we talk about endings, loss, change, we're talking about deep existential issues. Yeah. That um, are with us from birth in many ways. And the more sort of losses we have, and especially if they haven't been grieved for in a healthy way, then endings may evoke uh, particularly difficult feelings. Yeah. That the client or the therapist strive to keep away from. Yeah. I think for I me... That. When I hear... Go on. No, I was just going to say, I think for me, it is something that I started working on when I was doing my training because I was very well aware that I'm I wasn't very good with endings I've, I've usually say training for example I've, I've usually part way through one training and I've already got the next training lined up so one just takes over from the other so I don't actually end one thing without having the next thing already started if that makes sense and it was at that point where I, I started thinking What's that about? Why, why, and not celebrating endings either is something that I tended to do in the past. I would just get a qualification or a certificate and put it in the drawer and not really pay much attention to it and just crack on with the next thing. You hear it a lot. Uh, people come into the clinical room and, um, you know, TA might be called the B strong driver where they just go up one part of the mountain then they go to the next part of the mountain then they go to the next part of the mountain and then they get to the top 
but what they've left out is enjoying the you know enjoying the actual process of getting up the mountain in the first place so yeah. they've never stopped to look around at the plateau and the green grass to celebrate the whole journey 100 percent and I don't know if you remember the year that I graduated, I came with my full cap and gown because I'd never graduated anything in my life before. No, I don't but remember that. I made a big hoo-ha about it because I wanted to stop that process and actually enjoy the process and congratulate myself for, for seeing it through and graduating. And I didn't sign up for anything else for quite a while after. There we are. And you, you know... What you said earlier on again is a very good point. Um, positive side, you know, uh, um, when you well you didn't say this, but I'm going to reframe it. You know, when you end in a positive way, you can then say hello in a really healthy way. Yes. yes. Yeah, I like that. That's a really good point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But of course, Eric Byrne wrote a book in 1969 called What Do You Say After You Say Hello? Yeah, I think I've got that one up there as well. Okay. You, probably, <laughs> you probably can get it from eBay for about, you know, five or something. But it, it was a very nice little book. What I liked about it, it was that it was accessible to the reader. But mostly it was around script. Yes. And it was about, you know, uh, how we actually may sort of just carry out our script um you know after we after we say hello or after we say goodbye and i think that's very true around endings yeah to get to a healthy place where you can say a healthy hello it, it may take some time between the therapist and the client uh when you end and according to what therapists you talk about uh they may say oh yes uh in any endings with my client i'll take at least a month yeah so we can sort out if there's any sabotage processes which might stop the client saying a healthy hello. Yeah. And I, I do think that's a lovely way of saying it because, you know, endings aren't always, you know, we're, we're not talking about a death or a fracture or a breakdown of a relationship or anything. Like you say, sometimes endings are just connected with changes, making a change and, mm -hmm. you know, saying goodbye in a healthy way to the old us and welcoming in the new newer version of us it's it, there's lots of interpretations as to what endings and beginnings are yeah and there's a lot written about it and uh, uh, and rightly so because endings lost change hello uh are existential issues at the very core yeah of our being yeah 100% the other thing I wanted to touch on, you know, be, because obviously we're psychotherapists and maybe talking with psychotherapists that are listening is about um, a living will as a therapist, oh, whether yeah, that's therapy. something that people have, have thought about. Oh, yes. I mean, a lot in the UKCP, which is the major regulating body for psychotherapists. As United Council um, of Psychotherapy, um, they stipulate uh, that psychotherapists um, should make a, what is called a living will. Yeah. And um, so, for example, if a client, if a you know, if a therapist suddenly dies or or whatever, that their clients, you know, who takes over their clients? And, yeah. Who's going to be responsible for the practice and who's going to take over the contracts which the clients have been working towards or working for or working in general? Um, that's what you mean by living well, don't you? Well, yeah, yeah. And even on a, you know, that is the definition of a living well, but even on a scaled down version, if you're in private practice and you are suddenly taken ill, then who notifies your clients and what happens and how does that work rather than, you know, if we're talking about, working with clients that are going through quite you know deep stuff and suddenly we don't turn up one week the impact that that potentially could have on that client so it's about having a, a plan in place really for certain eventualities as a psychotherapist yeah and the united 
Kingdom Council Psychotherapy stipulates that. Yeah. So if we're going to certify people to work at a clinical level, the UKCP talks about living wills exactly the way you do and um, says all practitioners need to have sorted that out. Yeah. Which is one of the things, you know, when you're setting up, I suppose, or maybe people that are in practice, it's not something that you think about. No, but insurance companies do. Yeah. So I think of um, Benedon and, uh, sorry, Berlin, and also the Scottish Psychological Society, I know, and various, oh, Towergate, perhaps. Um, it'd be interesting. I haven't gone down this line to check, but um, it might be part of their insurance, this um, process. Yeah. The therapist gets living. The therapists get living wills. So I'm with Valence, and I don't think it was ever brought up on my insurance when I took it out. Uh, okay. I can't remember it being. Uh, but, super, yeah. Supervisors. Yeah. Need to bring it up. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, it, it was just another thought that I had when I was writing so, some things it, down about it, it. It's very, 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 very important because. I think to be an ethical uh, psychotherapist, um, then it's important to ha have this in place. Uh, and it, it's, it is through the integrity, uh, you know, ethical uh, processes and um, a duty of care towards our clients. Yeah. Yeah. And I, th I think for me, that was the main one is, a, you know, a duty of care to clients that, you know, somebody knows how to get in touch with them if anything happened to me. Yeah, well, all that. Uh, so it's a very important point. I don't know uh, if many people talk about it, but I think the supervisors need to check up on it. Yeah. I think if you work within an organisation, <clears throat> it's, it's completely different to if you're a one-man band and you're working on your own. You, you know, the theoretically the organization would pick up the clients if if you know anything happened to you like at the nhs or whatever it is but if you're working in private practice and there's just you then there isn't anybody else that's gonna pick that up for you potentially no very good point i'm glad you brought it up for people listening yeah so if you haven't got one explore the the opportunity <laughs> and you know do something about it now <laughs> No, no, that's true. Uh, I had somebody in the other day, and this is very common what I'm going to say now, who came in because they were so burdened down with the many losses they'd had in their own life that they wanted... To, we're talking about bereavement counselling, really. Yeah, yeah. They wanted somebody who could help them work with the um, losses and uh, endings so they could say hello to life in a different way yeah i really do like the way that you put that mm, mm. yeah because yeah. That, if we're burdened down with endings and you know grief and the past and all that's entailed in that we're not truly living life are we no no it's a so, uh, you know, I'm, I pass that on to somebody who could work in that way. Um, and, and I get many clients who come on, come in specifically for these processes. Um, yeah. Not all therapists are good at this, working with um, bereavement, grief, endings. And it's largely because of their own counter-transference. Yeah. And I think that it's really important to have supervision when you're dealing specifically with people who uh, need to do multiple grief cycles, if you want to put it that way. Yeah. Mm. And uh, on another and on another level, um, another thing about endings is people who have come in who have had such severe traumas, like talk about sexual abuse or yeah. um, people who are have had ritual abuse or multiple abuse, whichever way you want to put around this, who have um, shut down parts of their self, which is an ending in itself, 
um, and they need somebody to help them who uh, uh, you know a psychotherapist to help them say hello to parts of themselves again yeah yeah which again would be long-term stuff to you know to to reconnect with those shut down places because it's all out of our awareness isn't it it's discounting and not not really knowing mm. that we've done that in the first place mm. yeah mm. Mm. so that's another sort of form of ending and um helping the person move towards a more vibrant sense of self and saying hello to themselves again yeah yeah. We are talking about very, very big issues here. Now, um, Irvin Yalom, who's a, one of the most famous existential psychotherapists, he's American, he's written many, many books. Um, and one of the, his books is called Staring into the Sun. And it's about death anxiety. And in that, I get that one. Yeah, in that book, his central premise is the is that from birth, we um, would always have a sense, uh, sense of, or low grade sense of death anxiety. And as, and as life involves itself, and maybe we have traumas and maybe we don't, but the more, as life goes on, we may get in touch with that death anxiety even more. And there's certain losses traumas may mean the death anxiety becomes more prevalent so the person starts thinking about death they start fantasizing it's about death they start to be paranoid about losses and changes uh, and in this particular book which i really like by the way there's a 10 point plan on how to deal with death anxiety sounds like my kind of book i like a plan <laughs> <laughs> and and, and for somebody who has suffered from death anxiety, because I had a had a heart surgery two and a half years ago, and um, you know it really affected me at that, these existential levels. And and after it, um, it, I had a lot of anxiety about death, um, and I found the book very useful. Yeah, my dad was the same. He he had a heart attack, and he he had quite a few problems after that yeah mm, with mm. you know anxiety panic attacks those sorts of things feeling like it was happening again and whatnot so yeah, I, yeah i'll, yeah. I'll so, definitely look into it, that book yes by yalum y a y a l u m yeah because it's surprising the amount of people i think do have death anxiety or anxiety around that yeah <laughs> Yeah, there is course, a fear of talking about it generally we don't tend to talk about it no i walk from did uh didsbury uh, uh i've got a house overlooking fletcher moss to chorlton which is four miles and i walk past southern cemetery most days which is a huge cemetery and i often think about death that's because i walk past the cemetery and walk yeah. and when i come back i walk walk past it yeah but, you know just thinking about it while you're talking um i never did interesting i either came by a car or bicycles um uh while i'm with the clients and then i had the heart surgery and stopped working with the clients so i haven't walked past the cemetery and then gone to see clients but I wonder if I had have done, you know, if I if I had to walk past the cemetery, started thinking about, you know, certain aspects of death or loss or change or whatever, and then I go and see a client. I never did that, but there's the counter transfer straight away. Yeah. It's often what we bring into the room may have a really, really big bearing on the content. Or even the lack of content, which is shared between the therapist and the client. Yeah. And again, like you say, I think, you know, our own personal life events or, you know, the events that the client is going through are going to evoke certain things around endings. And, and, you know, like you say, saying hello, it's every day is a different day. 
I I was doing some work with um, clients and a group around the ages and stages by Pam Levin and oh, the, yeah. the cycles of power. And mm-hmm. I quite like that way of looking at things, that everything is in a cycle. You know, we think of life as being very linear and there's a beginning, a middle and an end to it. Whereas, you know, there is a wonderful way of looking at things that everything is in a cycle and it's the way it's meant to be. Uh, I, I couldn't argue with that. Which I quite like. <laughs> it's called Cycles of Power. It is, it is. I love that book. Yeah. Pam Levin, she's a TA therapist, or was. I think she's still alive. And uh, it's a great book. Yeah. And the fact that we're constantly recycling, you know, so every ending and every beginning is just another cycle that, that we go through in life. And I, I kind of do agree with that. Well, yes, of course. I mean, if you look at... Yes, on a much bigger scale, um, we see cycles in everything, really. Yeah, yeah. I, I certainly agree with you on that. Um, so it's an important subject. It's one that I don't think is talked about enough. And certainly, you know, I think therapists need to, especially if they have a lot of loss themselves and they feel they haven't dealt with it, um, you know, may come from a counter transferential position and they need to, uh, I think, reflect on that. Yeah. And as always, like you said, supervision. Take things to supervision if you've got any any issues yourself to work through. So what a wonderful place to end that one, Bob. And we'll be back for the next episode where we're going to be talking a little bit about self-esteem issues. Oh, wow. Upwards and onwards. Upwards and onwards. I'll see you in the next episode. Certainly will. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.